So we have been covering native plants a lot on this channel. In the last couple weeks, I've been doing lists of native plants as well because it's still a little chilly outside. No plants are in bud and bloom, so we can't really take walks through the gardens quite yet because nothing looks really impressive at all. You're gonna be seeing twigs and brown stuff. Not really exciting <laughs> quite yet. Just give it a couple months, you know? But uh, just as a recap, last couple weeks we covered 35 native herbaceous shade plants. And then in the last video we covered, I don't know how many shrubs we covered. We covered quite a lot, native shrubs that could be alternatives to 10 non-native shrubs. So today I figured we would cover kind of sub canopy flowering trees. And this is an important category here at Flock because we have taken this area that we are basically calling the interstitial area. It's this rectangular swath of land that separates our forest area from the, the meadow area, the area that used to be all greenhouses and a container nursery and that we've kind of basically um, you know, redid that and uh, planted seeds and turned that into more or less a meadow that has, you know, it's still in progress. We'll see. This is going to be the second year that it's going to be in bloom. And usually at, at year three, year four, that's when you start to see some of the fruits of your labor, all the, the seeding that happened, what actually really comes up. So we're going to be really keen on seeing what happens there. But going back to this interstitial area, what I kind of envisioned is really coming up the road and seeing just all these beautiful subcanopy flowering trees. So these are trees that I would say technically get somewhere between 15 feet all the way up to maybe 30 feet. So these aren't in their maturity ginormous trees that are 50 to 90 feet tall. These are ones, some of the trees that actually will flower in the subcanopy of the forest. So I didn't want any big honking trees kind of on the outside within that interstitial area because I wanted to really still maintain um, a nice herbaceous layer because it does face the, the sun and I didn't want to block too much into the forest because in that area we're planning on doing some agroforestry, maybe some pawpaw trees, maybe some persimmons, growing some ramps, things along those lines. So I, I really did envision this like beautiful, you know, walk or drive up with gorgeous flowering trees that may flower from, let's say, April through June or July, for instance. Now, we have a lot of native flowering trees already in the area, and I think that's really important when you're like analyzing your, your land, you know, what is already on the land, and can you actually increase that or propagate it or encourage it a bit more? One of our initial walkthroughs, the forest, a couple of the plants that I saw that would like kind of fit into that uh, sub canopy flowering category was amelanchier, and that's the first one that I'll be covering. This is called serviceberry, it's also called juneberry, it's called shadbush, and it gets this beautiful little kind of pectinous bluish, kind of like a blueberry. I mean, I would say that if I had to compare the taste a blueberry, like a watery blueberry, might be actually the closest taste that I could get to, <clears throat> to a service berry. These are plants that usually grow from like zones four through nine, and they host quite a lot of insect species. So what I mean by that is that insects will, will actually rely on this plant as its major food source. And that's important because as we know, the vast majority of our bird species actually rely on cat insects like caterpillars, for instance, in order to create their broods. So the more that we could basically bring in some of these native plants that act as host species for insects that our birds and other wildlife eat, then that will actually increase our ability to have interactions with our wildlife and see some really cool species. So amelanchier actually hosts about 100 
in 24 different insect species within the state of New York. So, you know, if you're looking at amelanch here in maybe your region or your state, you might have a varying number of insect host species. And there are quite a lot of different species of amelanch here that are native to New York, but it's very hard to find them all in the horticultural trade. You'll also find crosses. So a popular cross would be uh, Amelanchier labus with Amelanchier arborea, and that's Amelanchier uh, cross grandiflora, I think the, the name is. And you'll often see like autumn brilliance, all these different kind of cultivars that may be cultivated for a really brilliant color in the fall or maybe a, a tastier berry. It's not something, it's not a berry that I would necessarily um, eat all the time. I mean, it's, it's a fine berry and, and birds absolutely adore it and you could totally eat it. It's just that I think that there are slightly tastier berries. It doesn't have as much flavor, for instance, as like a blueberry, but uh, you know, other people might want a little more of a subtle taste. But there are quite a bit, like I said, of, of different species of amelanch here, and I'm really keen on getting as many of the species as I could possibly find. Typically, you could find like amelanch canadensis, amelanch lavis, uh, I also got Amelanchia, Amelanchia stolonifera, which I wouldn't necessarily put in the same category as a subcanopy tree because it's more prostrate and it is more of a shrub. So it's like kind of imagine like a tallest, tallish shrub. And I've actually covered Amelanchia, Amelanchia stolonifera also on this uh, channel before on um, ground covers, fruiting ground covers. I think I did 15 fruiting ground co covers on this channel and that actually made the cut. Very unique plant. I mean, I really like that those plants that look like subcanopy, shrubby or um, trees and you could actually get their equivalent essentially uh, on the ground spreading in a more prostrate manner. So that's pretty cool. But there's other amelanchiers out there that I think are just challenging to get like the arborea, the humulus, Interior is another one, uh, Nantucket, Nantucanensis, um, Albavallis, Sanguinea. So plenty of amelanch here out there, and I would really hope that some of our horticulturalists, some of the folks who are focused on our native plants will actually increase their uh, opportunities for us to get plants that are like outside of the, the typical. So that is the first one. I would put amelanch here kind of like in a whole category um, as number one. So the second one that I would feature is Cersus canadensis, and this is our Eastern red bud. We're in New York and Cersus canadensis kind of is on, like their Northern border is up towards kind of New York, but it's a tree that grows well from four through nine. So it does grow in a bit more colder climate. And you can find so many cultivars of Cersus canadensis. This is really a truly spectacular tree. It'll start to flower before it leaves out. And the leaves are exquisite. They look like little heart-shaped leaves. And you'll find a lot of cultivars that have different colors of leaves. You could find ones that are variegated or that are like bright green. You'll find ones that like forest pansy and a num number of others that are more like a Merlot color or reddish purple color. There's tons of different varieties. You'll find weeping varieties. You'll find ones that are multi-stem. You'll find one that are one stem. So there's quite a lot that are out there and the flowers are magnificent. They're kind of this like reddish purple flower that, uh, that appears like all along the stems, sometimes on the trunk of the tree. And it's in the Fabaceae family. I didn't mention that. Amelanchier is in the Rosacea fam Rosace Rosaceae family, which a lot of the flowering trees that I'll mention are. But uh, Cersus canadensis is in the Fabaceae family. And if you recognize Fabaceae, it's the legume family. And those are often nitrogen fixers. But you know, I remember when I was doing some um, uh, mine reclamation and I was like, oh, Cersus canadensis, it's in the legume family. It probably fixes nitrogen. It will be a really, maybe it's a, that's a, that could be a really important tree in areas where we need to fix more nitrogen and create more soil, et cetera, et cetera. Well, it turns out that it doesn't really fix nitrogen. It doesn't have those, uh, those, those interactions with the bacteria in its, in its root system the same way that most nitrogen fixers have. So it's kind of a, this unusual 
outlier as far as legumes go. But still, that's kind of besides the point. Part of the, part of the reason why this tree is so magnificent is because it's one, one of those sub canopy trees that just has a magnificent bloom. And it's one of the ones that I've definitely uh, featured in, at Flock. And there were already Circus canadensis here. And I'm not quite sure if they were like uh, here because they were nursery escapees. Definitely some were planted in the landscape from the nursery, but then I found a lot of little seedlings kind of all over. I'm guessing they were nursery escapees, but it was really neat to see some of the seedlings kind of popping up in specific areas. I guess one of the things I should say about Eastern Redbud too is that it is an important tree for insect host species. It hosts about 23 different insect species. So maybe not as much as like an amelanchier or an oak or like a cherry or whatnot, but definitely is important to some insects out there. Now the next one that I'm gonna feature is one that I hadn't seen growing here. And it's going to be one that I am going to be a bit more cautious with, and I'll share why in a second. But this is Keonanthus virginicus, which is the white fringe tree. And this is a, a tree that grows well from zones three through nine. So it does grow through quite a range. And it's in the family Oleaceae. And you'll, it's a beautiful tree. There's also a Chinese variety that have been, has been brought in in the horticultural trade. And the flowers are really white and fleecy. And I have one of these planted in kind of like outside a garden bed as more of an ornamental tree. It's one that I would like to grow more kind of in that interstitial because it's a bit more wild and everything along those lines. And I think it would add to the flowers. But the reason why I'm a bit more cautious with this one is because it's become a secondary host to the emerald ash borer. And you may say, well, why? Because I thought emerald ash borers only affect ash trees. Well, Fraxinus ash is also in the same family, Oleaceae. And one of the things that we know and that we've learned is that when plants are within the same, definitely within the same genus, within the same, and within the same family, often have similar chemical structures. And so if you have this invasive emerald ash borer that's killing all the ash trees and some of those ash trees are gone, well, it may look for its next suitable host. And that is happening, unfortunately, to our fringe trees. So I wouldn't say I would go out and get like a dozen different fringe trees and start planting them all over because we do have emerald ash borer here. And I want to monitor that, ash, uh, that uh, fringe tree very carefully because it could possibly serve as a secondary host. Even it's, and it's one of our native trees and that's really sad, right? Now there are some uh, parasitoids that have been released in certain states to see if they could combat the invasive emerald ash borer. And it's very new. I mean, I think these are just happening within the last like several years, maybe in the, in, even just within the last two to three years. So it's still kind of a, a new biocontrol. They had to bring it over from Asia in order to see if this parasitoid will attack the emerald ash borer. I don't know how specific it is to the emerald ash borer, but again, you have to be careful, right? Because here you see the ash borer jumping over to a like species within the same family, and you don't want that happening in the same um, way to a native insect that it's within the same family of the emerald ash borer and it just hops over in, in the same, you know, you, it's, it's like you're repeating your, the same mistakes twice. So this is something that I would just uh, throw out a word of caution for you. If you have native wild, uh, fringe trees in your area or you see some that are starting to get a little like uh, affected by this, then I would, you know, I would inform your county cooperative extension or your nearest university that might actually be studying emerald ash borer and report it. So again, something that I'm just kind of experimenting with. We'll actually see if this survives. Right now the tree is really small, so it pretty much wouldn't be uh, something that I, I think an emerald ash borer would even look at. And plus we still have quite a few ash trees around here 
that I would say that would be more of a target for the emerald ash borer. All right, the next one on my list is Cornus alternifolia. And this is the pagoda dogwood or the alternate leaf dogwood. And this is in the Cornaceae family. And I am gonna be highlighting another cornice, and I didn't kind of lump them in the same way as Amelanchier, but I'll tell you why. The Pagoda dogwood is uh, pretty different from Cornus florida, which is the flowering dogwood, which would be my, my number five that I'll mention. And Pagoda dogwood is much more cold hardy. So you'll find it in zones three through seven. And the flowering dogwood, you'll find more through five through nine. So it's, it's kind of a, the flowering dogwood is a bit more of a warmer climate species. Plus the flowers are different. Cornus alternifolia has these kind of like uh, smaller white flowers that don't have these really big bracts, which looks like the flower petals of a Cornus florida, but they're actually bracts and the flowers are like the little white centers or yellow centers in the, in the middle of those bracts. And Cornus alternifolia and Cornus florida both are important plants for insect hosts. So they host 129 insect species, which is awesome. And I think they're some of the most beautiful subcanopy flowering trees that are out there. One thing I will say is that Cornus florida is a bit more susceptible to anthracnose and the alternifolia is less so. And I think that there's much more crosses of like Cusa, Cornus Cusa, which is more of an Asian variety with Cornus florida, and they are uh, uh, less susceptible to anthracnose. So those are things that you could, you know, kind of look at if your trees are starting to be a bit more diseased um, and they're not getting maybe the appropriate like soil, uh, then perhaps you could look into ones that are a little hardier in your area. So I would go with a Cornus alternifolia. And the reason why it's called pagoda dogwood is that it kind of grows in these like stepwise function. It just looks like it's growing in shelves, which people really love the structure of. I personally love the structure of. So it's one of the plants that we're actually currently not growing, but I ordered it for this year so that we could plant it within our habitat. And we're grow growing quite a bit of Cornus florida and also Cornus cusa already within the landscape. But those are flowering subcanopy trees that I would definitely say are quite beautiful and would encourage you to try and grow in your landscape. Next one is uh, really important to me in many different levels and that is Crategus. This is the hawthorn. And it's one of the plants that I identified when I was walking through the forest. I was like, oh wow, we have these, this hawthorn. You'll notice it because it gets these like really big uh, thorns on it. So you know, <laughs> there was one when I was walking through the forest is like, if you weren't paying attention, it literally was like a thorn right at, at eye level. So you just have to be a, a bit more careful because it is a sub canopy tree. It doesn't grow too huge. You know, again, most of these trees are growing anywhere from like, I would say 15 feet to 30 feet tall. And um, it gets a really beautiful bark, a really beautiful flower. It's in the family of Rosaceae. And the berry is in extremely important. In fact, it's a really important herbal remedy. And I actually take Hawthorn regularly as well. Very good for the heart and regulating heartbeat. But Crategus, broadly speaking, zones four through seven, we have a number of uh, species of Crategus, and again, it's hard to actually find all of them. So, and, uh, and oftentimes they're kind of lumped in the same category, but there's Crategus cruzgali, which is the cockspur hawthorn. Then we have Crategus mollus, which is the downy hawthorn. And then we have the Crategus phanopyrum, which is the Washington hawthorn. And the Washington hawthorn is the one that I could find the most of. Um, you'll find other Crateguses that may not be native to your area, but look similar. You know, there's differentiations between the, the berries. There's uh, differentiations between the leaves and not much the flowers. You know, sometimes you'll get ones that have like pink flowers more than their, their white colored flowers. And this is an important uh, tree for insects. 173 insects actually use this as a host species. So... Again, really awesome tree. I don't know of any thornless varieties unless they maybe cross it with a completely different tree. Um, shout out in the comments below if you know of any kind of thornless varieties. 
So you just wanna be mindful where you're planting this one. Um, if you have like little kids and things like that, maybe you don't wanna plant like a thorny tree around your area. But again, very important tree from an herbal and medicinal standpoint. Um, wildlife absolutely loves it. Uh, it's a tr uh, sub canopy tree that could actually support a lot of birds as far as like, yes, as far as fruits go, but also as uh, an area where uh, birds can actually nest. So that would be a nice selection. And again, I'm kind of putting the Critiga species all in under one umbrella. So that would be my number six. Number seven, I guess you could consider this a shrub, but I'm gonna put it into the sub canopy tree. And this is Hamamelis virginiana, which is our common witch hazel. And this is one of the few trees that is basically blooms in the winter months. So it's blooming in like November, December. You could get other hemimelises. Sometimes you could get crosses uh, with Vernalis and some other ones from Asia that bloom more into January, February and can serve as uh, a pollinator source for some of those early pollinators, especially ones that come out if there's like some warm January or February days. So it's kind of neat to see actually a plant like this uh, putting out these little tattered, ribbony yellow flowers. A lot of the cultivars have slightly different colors like reds and pinks and oranges and things along those lines. But this is a native plant that I have also seen growing in the subcanopy of our forest. So it's one of those ones that I wanna pull out a little bit, just kind of coax out into that interstitial area and start growing some more of that. I think it's kind of got this scraggly uh, look look to it. it um, and I, I don't mind actually that scraggly look to it. I think it looks uh, more interesting. It doesn't have to have this like perfect rounded crown. I think it gives it a bit more character, if you will. Um, so Hamamelis virginiana, again, also a nice, uh, a nice herbal, a nice medicinal. That's where we get our witch hazel from, you know? So I think that it's, uh, uh, it's, it, it's a good plant. And it's in the Hamamelidaceae family, and it is a host species for about 68 different insects. So again, pretty important within our bigger scheme of things. All right, the eighth plant that I would say is Magnolia virginiana. And this is our Sweet Bay Magnolia. It's one of the plants that I started to plant here at, at Flock. I will say that this is a plant that's kind of on the border. It, it's good from zones five through nine, but it's not as cold tolerant as some of the other magnolias. But the reason why I chose this one is because it doesn't get much larger than 25 feet tall. Sure, you could find ones that are, um, are really big, but this is one of the magnolias that could stay a bit smaller. Of course, you could get like cultivars. We have like, I think Magnolia Jane that we planted out front that uh, stays pretty quaint and pretty small, but uh, I'm, I'm kind of highlighting the, the species that are native, or at least putting more emphasis on the species that are native. This plant is a host species for about 18 different insects, and it's in its own family, so all magnolias are basically in that Magnoliaceae family. And as I mentioned, it's just not as cold hardy as the others, so if you wanna look into the other native magnolias, please do but I just wanted to highlight this one because I would say this one is a bit more of um, a sub canopy tree. The next one on the list is also growing here natively at Flock, and this is our native apple, essentially. It's Malus coronaria, which is the sweet crab apple, or sometimes folks will call it the white sweet, sweet crab apple. And it's good to zones four through seven, so it could get a little colder than here as well. And this is in the family Rosace Rosaceae, and it hosts quite a lot of insect species, so 309 insect species, very important tree. It is susceptible to rusts. So I know a lot of the horticulturists have bred uh, crab apple varieties that are less susceptible to rust or not susceptible to rust. And there are some really beautiful flowering varieties. I did speak with uh, uh, Ted from Coldwater Pond. We did an excellent tour with his nursery and I was wondering about some of the cultivars of our crab apples. There's one that had been planted here already and it shoots up all these different sprouts around the, the bottom. So these are sprouts that are not true to the grafted type, the, the type that's on the, the top of the rootstock and um, are more indicative to the type that's on, that's on the rootstock. 
And so it's basically reverting back. And then you have to cut off all these little root suckers and root sprouts. And it's a, it's a pain in the butt, if you ask me. But he said that's really common for, especially with some of the older root stocks that were used with crab apple varieties. So this one was like a, is a weeping crab apple, essentially. And it was put on this root stock, and I'm always cutting off the suckers. Um, it just is really, <laughs> really annoying. And I think that's one thing that you won't get with like a species, a straight species is that it's not going to set up, uh, set out a bunch of root suckers, I mean, in, in that kind of capacity. So anyway, so Malus coronaria, I would say, is a really beautiful one. We do have some cultivated varieties that we are bringing to flock. And again, that you can't beat some of the flowers on some of those crab apples. And it turns out to be an excellent pollinator plant as well. All right, the next group of plants that I'm gonna be covering are, I'm not putting under an umbrella, but they are all prunus. And this would be our kind of plums and cherries. They are in the same family of rosaceae. So they get really beautiful little white flowers typically. And the reason why I'm going to put them in their own number or their own uh, category is because they're each slightly different. Uh, they give slightly different fruits, obviously, because they're different species. And you can't really find them all the same way. And I want to I want to pull them out a little bit and kind of throw them out there because I would love to find some of these in the horticultural trade so that I could, you know, grow them here at Flock. And I just want to throw it out there because if I'm interested, maybe some other folks would be interested as well. So the first one of the prunus that I'll actually be highlighting is Prunus alleghaniensis. This is one that I can't find on the horticultural trade. It's called the Allegheny plum and it's good from zones four through eight. And I will say just as a general overview, prunus is really important to our native insect species. 455 insects use this as a host plant. So I'll just kind of say that out right now because all of these plants that I'm gonna be highlighting in the next few ones are prunus. And, um, and stay around because I have some more plants after the prunus. But Prunus alleghaniensis, the Allegheny plum, as I mentioned, that's one that I'm actually looking for. Give a shout out in the comments if you know where I might be able to get one. I'll be checking like my local nurseries uh, who are focused on native plants this spring as well. So I'm gonna still do some more sleuthing. The next one we're actually growing here at Flock and this is Prunus americana. This is the American plum. It's good from zones three through eight. And again, like, like you, you would think, it does give you a nice little plum. Now there are some cultivated varieties that you could find that might have a little bit of a sweeter plum or anything along those lines, but I was just basically looking for the straight species. The next one is also one that I'm still searching for. It's called the Chickasaw plum, and this is Prunus angustifolia, and it's, it's a little less cold tolerant than the others I had mentioned. So, it could actually work in New York. It's a zone five and it's good from zones five through nine. But if you're in a, like a colder microclimate within New York, I would try to, to plant it more in like the, the slightly warmer, maybe south facing area. So that is the Chickasaw plum, gives a slightly different, like I think more of like a, a brownish uh, reddish plum versus one that's more purplish blue. The next one is an interesting one, uh, Prudus maritima. It's one that I had seen growing as a park tree in Brooklyn and one year it gave out so many fruits, so many beach plums. And this is a plant that really varies widely as far as taste because some plums that you might get off of it are, are intensely astringent and there's others that are sweeter. So if you could find one that has a bit more of like a, a sweeter taste, then I think that's probably a plus. A lot of folks will make uh, jams or jellies out of this uh, plum, but I also think that it's a really beautiful sub canopy tree and one that would provide a lot of benefit for wildlife and could grow in like slightly drier, more beachier areas, like hence the name beach plum. So that is a pretty interesting one that I would just throw out there and one that we actually planted here at Flock. Final one is one that we are growing, and this is Prunus nigra, and it's called the Canada plum. And this is definitely one of the more cold, hardy species. So zones three through eight, so it could grow up towards Canada, hence the name Canada plum. And I know it is a plant that uh, a lot of Canadian nurseries will, will grow. And uh, I'm waiting, I, I think I only have one here at Flock, and I'd like to actually grow more than one. It's, it's, 
it's better if you have like two or three so you could do some more cross pollination. And uh, yeah, so that's one that I would say and I would suggest growing. And again, I could have actually put these all in their own like little category like I did with Amelanc gear, kind of just toss it all as like one number. But I wanted to kind of pull and tease those out because I think those are all fairly interesting as far as fruit fruiting trees and uh, and ones that aren't equally grown, you know, kind of like the Amelanc gear that aren't equally grown within the horticultural trade. All right, the last two are in the genus Sorbus, which is our mountain ashes. And this is not one that I had seen growing at Flock and one that I definitely would like to grow more of. And this is also in the family of Rosaceae. And they have really beautiful showy flowers and they get these clusters of berries that are like kind of this orangish, like fire orange, fire engine orange, like red, essentially. And the first one is Sorbus Americana, which is the American mountain ash. I could find that one much more in the horticultural trade than I could find the last one that I'm gonna feature, which is Sorbus Decora, which is the showy mountain ash. Um, so American mountain ash is a bit more cold hardy. You could find it in zones two through five. And Sorbus decora actually grows a little warmer. It goes from zones two through six. So you can actually find this growing up through some of the coldest parts of Canada as well. So it's one of those great trees for that. But like I said, grows those beautiful flowers and grows fruits that are really important to animals. In fact, as far as like insect host goes, it's an insect host for about 74 species. So it's definitely one of those plants that I wanted to bring here at Flock and encouraged to grow because I think that sub canopy layer of flowering trees is something that we often overlook and is one that I would like to cultivate more of, especially because it doesn't feel so intimidating, especially when you're kind of uh, walking through the area. A, a 15 to 30 foot high tree feels more relatable. It actually feels more like you're walking through a naturalistic orchard than you are through this kind of foreboding forest in some cases. And the fact that it gives these beautiful flowers and these really beautiful fruits is not only delightful for humans, but is also delightful for our wildlife, whether that may be insects or birds or animals. So anyway, that's my 16 of them. I think at Flock we're growing about 10 of them and we would like to, you know, kind of expand you know, beyond the 10 that we're growing if we could find those others. So again, if you know some really good sources or really good uh, nurseries for some of these plants, feel free to mention them in the comments below because obviously not everybody who's watching is from New York. You might have some great native nurseries in your area that are uh, growing some of these plants. Otherwise, thank you guys. Enjoy the day. It is much warmer here. The bulbs are coming out in our grass, which is really lovely to see. We'll have to give you an update video on that because this is year two of the bulbs. Um, actually year one in one area because we just uh, augured in by hand 10,000 bulbs in another area on the land. So, but they're all coming up this year and it looks absolutely fabulous. Right now it's just the Aranthus the galanthus and the crocus coming up. All right, folks, I will see you later. Thank you so much for the support on this channel. And if you like this video, give it a thumbs up, hit the subscribe button, hit that notifications button, and we'll see you in the next one. Bye.